Hello, and welcome to our failure analysis webinar. We thank you for your interest in this topic and in EAG, and we hope you find it valuable. So without further delay, let's get started. My name is Aram Sarkissian. I'm the General Manager of the Engineering Sciences Division at EAG. Uh, EAG is a service organization, and most of the focus in the Engineering Sciences Division is supporting microelectronic and semiconductor uh, chip companies uh, bring products to market. And as you'll see today, um, that extends into many non-traditional markets where we're seeing much more microelectronic content being utilized. Um, joining me today are my colleagues Winfield Scott, who is our Director of Technology. Um, Winfield has a real diverse set of experience and is a bit of a debug solution architect. And given the range and complexity of problems we see, uh, he's very helpful in helping us drive creative solutions. Um, Dan Sullivan manages one of our failure analysis labs. He brings decades of lab management and expertise, and also brings some unique material science expertise to the team, which is um, extremely helpful, as root cause FA these days can include a lot of deep dive material analysis, and having understanding in both electrical and physical domains can be very, very critical. So a little bit about what the Engineering Sciences Division does. We've got a range of services in the areas of test, reliability, and failure analysis that are generally all activities that are part of what goes into new product introduction and ongoing product improvement efforts. Um, today we'll be focusing on the failure analysis portion of what we do, but it's important to understand the power of having a multidisciplinary approach to being able to solve problems uh, really brings some distinct advantages to, um, to what we can do here at EHE. Um, as an example of that, being able to clearly see early mortality in a reliability qualification and then quickly perform failure analysis and then bring those learnings back can really add value to the customers and, and save valuable critical time in those early development efforts. So we're going to talk about a few different things today. Uh, the first section, we'll get into the impact of failures. And so today, in our um, world that is dominated by microelectronic content in all sorts of things, um, failures can be catastrophic. And so we'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, next, we'll take a look at what does it take to perform failure analysis. Really, what are the ingredients that go into it, and, and how do you do that well? And then thirdly, we'll get into some case studies. And I, I think it's important here to make sure it's understood that we at EAG take client confidentiality very seriously. So what we've got for you are some representative examples, and no actual client data is being used in these presentations. And then lastly, if you were part of a live webinar, we'd have a, uh, a bit of a live Q&A, but we certainly encourage you as you watch this online to reach out to us anytime to address any questions you may have. So this cartoon, while it might be a little bit amusing, is really uh, shows us where we don't want to be. Um, but too often, you know, absent good upfront prevention or inattention to potential issues, um, people find themselves in situations where they're often scrambling to explain what happened, and that's simply not a situation you want to be in. So good upfront failure analysis and early product interrogation is really a learning tool that not only solves the problems you have now, but may help you from preventing the problems on future products and um, incorporating into your development as you go forward. So what is the problem and how have the challenges today gotten more difficult to overcome? So one major area is the complexity of systems is increasing. Um, functional complexity is one area of that. Uh, the components and systems that we've got today do much more, and when they do more, it's harder to pinpoint failure in that sea of different functionality. Um, another area is the integration of what used to be separate discrete components or subsystems. Um, putting those all together into much larger systems makes it difficult to then isolate and pinpoint where failures are occurring. Another area is the exotic materials, so different material sets um, and newer materials that are coming into fabrication and assembly techniques are uh, tougher to debug and you need different sort of sets of skills, different sets of tools to really deal with those, those different material sets. And then the other is just increasing intermittent and thought failures where failures may be subtle. You're not talking about 
uh, hard shorts, hard opens, or massive physical damage, you're talking about subtle electrical nuances that you have to uncover, and that can be challenging. The next major area that's problematic is the cost of failure is high. So microelectronics certainly give us a lot of productivity, and they're used in all sorts of facets of our lives, but the more we utilize them, the more we're dependent on them, and when they fail, that failure can be catastrophic. So that's another big area of uh, consideration. And really, when you think about all of the complexity of the above couple of things, what does that mean? It means you need a pretty advanced tool set and expertise set to do comprehensive failure analysis today, and that in and of itself kind of introduces complexity and um, can promote some problems. So here are some real examples of areas in our world that are really increasing in complexity. The first is the area of ICs and components. So the density of transistors on ICs has increased rapidly. So over 20 years, we've gone from millions of transistors on an IC to billions of transistors on an IC. And that miniaturization and shrinking and nanoscale that we're chasing really presents new challenges in terms of how we debug and how we uncover those problems. Uh, in addition to that are, are the packaging formats, uh, so not only the, the ICs themselves, but the things that we package them in so that they can be in mobile and other applications, uh, present some other challenges in terms of the material sets and the geometries and things that we're dealing with there. The second major area that has gotten exceedingly complex is network systems and data centers. So as we've uh, added new data and as we've, we've um, all run around with our mobile devices taking pictures, well, that data is going somewhere. There's a lot of networking and a lot of data centers behind the scenes. And those are complex, massive systems in, in effect that utilize a lot of um, different technology and bring them together uh, in one integrated system and debugging where in that network there may be problems can be challenging and you have to consider all the different interactions that may be taking place. Um, the third major area is we're, we're certainly taking technology uh, deep into the automotive world and we're creating a lot of new applications and while they're fun and exciting and, and, and helpful in automating our lives, uh, they need to be highly reliable. And um, as we get into these high reliability areas, making sure that we've got appropriate failure analysis so that we can uncover problems is going to be exceedingly important. And I used to say that the most complicated thing you'll ever own is your car, and quite frankly, that's truer today than it's ever been. So failures today can be huge in terms of the economic impact they have. Um, a few examples here. Uh, the latest Samsung Note 7 recall has a cost estimate of about $5.3 billion. Massive amount of, of loss over that. Um, General Motors had a faulty ignition switch, cost the company $4.1 billion in estimated loss. Um, there's an estimate that uh, Amazon's network um, will cost them $66,000 a minute, every minute that it's down. Uh, Southwest Airlines recently had a single router malfunction uh, for 12 hours, and that alone cost them $54 million. I was personally affected by that one. I remember not being able to take a flight home. And so not only is it economic damage, but it's the reputational damage that comes from uh, angry customers and not fulfilling orders and business disruptions and all the rest of it that can, that can live long beyond the actual event itself. It's estimated that 55% of small, medium business data disasters are uh, hardware failure. And hardware failures are responsible for 72% of network downtime. So failure analysis is key, uh, effective prevention even more important. Failure analysis can be applied across the lifespan of products, and that really starts in the early days of design and debug on those first prototypes and trying to bring those products to market in terms of the new product introduction efforts that are going on. Um, the next stage is really in the, the qualification of the device. At that stage, you're doing all of the appropriate reliability stresses and strains to ensure that that product is going to survive in whatever end use application it's going to be in. You know, from there, we move into to higher volume production. So now uh, the product's in production, and you may start to see manufacturing issues, yield loss or other things related to manufacturing that need to be investigated. And finally would be end-use applications. So now you have production units that are in the field, 
and due to whatever condition, this may be operator related or some particular use case, you've got failure. So in all these cases, there can be learnings that come from the, the analysis and brought back to uh, the companies in terms of product improvement and other related fixes. There are, of course, a wide range of industries that can benefit from failure analysis. We've got a number of them uh, listed here. Uh, these are some of the major industries we serve at EAG, and each might have particular issues that are more important uh, to them than others. Uh, time to market, for example, might matter a lot to companies in the consumer electronics space, whereas high reliability might be more applicable or appropriate to folks in the military or aerospace industries. As you might have gathered by now, all this translates into a huge range of failure analysis cases that we see. A number of those are listed here, and just because it's the same product, it's important to understand that the failure mode might be very different. So it's important that the investigation path we take is well thought out. In failure analysis, it takes the right combination of resources to be set up for success. Uh, people often think of tools as they're definitely an important part of the solution. You have to have the right tools and generally a wide range of them to help uncover issues. Uh, methodology is also an important pillar of FA. Without the right strategy and process for problem solving, uh, you could miss critical information and may reach incorrect conclusions. Uh, but gluing all that together is expertise. There's no substitute for experience and expertise when you're trying to look at problems from a variety of different angles. The right experts driving the failure analysis is vital and it delivers huge value. So with that in mind, I'd like to turn it over the presentation to one of our experts at EAG, Winfield Scott. Failure analysis starts with gathering information about the failing units, the failure mode, and the failure history. With this background information, an analysis plan can be created to work towards identifying the failure mechanism and the root cause. The failure analysis process begins with non-destructive steps to gather as much information as possible without altering the sample. Non-destructive steps include visual inspection, x-ray, acoustic microscopy, and electrical test. An important step is verifying the failure. The failure signature is needed to trace the failure down to the failure mechanism, but also to link that mechanism back to the initial reported failure mode. Troubleshooting and localization techniques are used to go from the whole device is failing to the failure is located at this particular area on the device. A physical analysis is then performed to expose and image the exact failure site and then determine the failure mechanism. The outcome of each analysis step is used to rule in or out different failure possibilities. The result of each step should support a failure mechanism or perhaps reject a mechanism so that it is both a deductive and inductive process. The process is iterative, meaning additional analysis steps are performed to test possible failure hypotheses, and the process is repeated until the failure mechanism is determined. A failure analysis lab has many tools to enable the process. The tools aid in localization, deconstruction, and materials analysis. Electrical isolation tools include thermal hotspot mapping, laser signal injection microscopy, and emission microscopy. X-ray shows the internal construction of a part and finds package integrity defects. Acoustic microscopy finds internal voids and delamination. Scanning electron microscopy provides high magnification imaging. Materials analysis techniques can map elements, identify chemical composition, corrosion compounds, and bulk materials. Now let's look at some case studies to see how these tools and techniques can be used to solve problems. At this point, I'll hand the presentation to Dan Sullivan. This is Dan Sullivan. I'm talking about the case study of the AeroSensor. 
Uh, we had an aero sensor that did pressure, altitude, temperature, and they were failing in the field after a few months of operation. Some of the failures would read zero altitude, others would read maximum. There was also intermittent failures that would come and go. And units that initially passed in the lab would fail after some hours of usage. In order to investigate the parts, we decided to disassemble them, and we took them out of the uh, initial casing there. We were able to examine them more directly. We had a known good unit and a unit that was failing uh, out in the field, and we can immediately see there's some sort of a contamination zone or a discoloration zone seen on the failing unit. So we decided to further investigate that. We did some electrical testing and did some internal visual on the part. And we saw that there was a leakage between pins that should not be occurring. So we used a probe station that you can see in the upper right-hand corner there to put down some uh, very fine probes onto different areas and check the electrical conductivity or check the leakage between those pins. The lower right-hand corner shows you a blow-up of some pins that are coming in to go touch down and do these electrical tests. So further optical inspection on the leads on that side, along with some SEM and EDAX, showed that there was a contaminant material there. We were able to also do EDAX, which I'll show on the next slide, which gives you some elemental composition and see what that material is. On examination, we could actually see there was dendritic material, which is in the upper right-hand corner picture here. It looks a little bit like snowflakes. This is typically a silver or a tin type material that's growing out with an electric field when in the presence of moisture. And what we saw with the EDAX, which is shown in the spectrum below, where we actually use the electron beam from the SEM imaging system to generate x-rays of the material. And those x-rays have certain energies depending on the material they come from. And what we can see here is that there's predominantly silver in the location. Uh, silver was used as a silver paint, as an epoxy uh, to have a conducting area elsewhere. And it obviously got into this part of the part and was causing some contamination issues. So to summarize this uh, failure analysis, we had an aerospace sensor that was failing after a couple of months in the field. It had errors, reading pressures and altitudes and temperatures that were incorrect, and the failures were intermittent. They would come and go. When we dis disassembled the part and we did investigation, we found silver dendrites to migration around the sensor device. This is due to an epoxy, uh, silver epoxy being used in the material. And they actually went through, and after this failure analysis, were able to change that material and get rid of this failure going forward. The next case study involves a medical device, in this case, the catheter. Uh, this uh, catheter had some electrical opens reported by the customer. It's about a 10% failure rate that was observed during testing. That failure rate's too high, and they wanted to figure out what they could do in order to change their design or get rid of the issue. The first test we did is non-destructive. It's called time deflator time domain reflectometry, in which case you put a pulse of current into the uh, sample and you look at the reflection. Every interface in the device you'll get a reflection. And by comparing a good unit from, uh, with a bad unit along with uh, the open unit, we could find out that this reflection was actually occurring differently on the bad unit than on the good unit right at the tip of the part. So we knew that's where the area was to go and investigate further to find the failure. The next non-destructive test we did is x-ray imaging. And what we did is on the left-hand side here, we looked into the device to see if we could see any failures. And you can see it's fairly crowded in there. It was hard to tell exactly what was going on. So we decided to do some further disassembly after this and remove one section out of the uh, off the main PCB board. Up in the upper right-hand corner, you can see this main area of interest appears to have a small crack in one of the copper wires. And when we zoom in on the lower right-hand side, that crack becomes more apparent. We just want to go and double-check and make sure that's really the case and that's not something else that's going on there. Under optical uh, in inspection, we can see that there's some sort of a cracking there occurring in the plastic and possibly down in the copper. Uh, that along with the uh, x-ray, we felt fairly confident there was a uh, crack in the copper and that was causing the issue, but we wanted to be absolutely certain. So we went and did a direct study uh, so we could look directly at the issue with a cross-section. When we did the cross-section, we actually uh, polished into the material, and this is actually the side view of the trace. And you can see clearly there's a break there, so there's no longer an electrical contact that's any good there. Now, you could imagine this is in a flex circuit. If we move this flex circuit around, these two ends may touch and then not touch and then touch and not touch, and that might give you an intermittent issue, uh, which can also be very difficult to find. But in this case, uh, we found the root cause, and we're able to see it quite clearly. 
So in this case, we were looking at a medical device issue, a catheter. There was an open circuit in the new product development, and we found that uh, we were able to isolate this down to the tip on the electronic joint, where we get fatigue occurring uh, and the signal line breaking. This is right where the attach of the flex circuit goes into a more uh, sturdy PCB. Uh, what they were able to do is then identify this as an issue and redesign their parts slightly so that we would remove the flexing issue and the bending of the flex circuit, which would fix the issue. I'll now turn this over to the next case study. In this case study, we look at a game console that was having video failures and causing a lot of returns from the field. We were able to look at the whole system and use non-destructive visual and x-ray techniques to determine that there were no problems with the PCB or the solder connections. The failure was isolated to the graphics processing unit, which was a particular chip on the board. Within the GPU, troubleshooting to the failing block found the electrical anomalies with specific transistors. The image on the right is a nanoprobe technique using an atomic force microscope in the conductive mode. There is a set of transistors that have higher leakage than the surrounding transistors. The transistor performance was measured and compared to good transistors. The transistors had low threshold voltage and were not turning off completely, which is why they were showing higher leakage in the uh, previous test. To find out what was physically different about the transistors, we used TEM, Transmission Electron Microscopy. These images compare a good and bad transistor. The arrow in the right image points to the transistor drain, where a difference can be seen in the silicide formation. The silicide is encroached into the channel region and changed the transistor threshold voltage. In this analysis, we went from a whole game console failing to a single chip failure to a transistor in the chip failing. Analysis of the transistor found a wafer fab process control problem. This let the game console company know it wasn't a problem with how they were manufacturing the console, but was an issue they could take up with their GPU vendor. The next case study is of an Internet of Things device. The IoT was failing during product qualification when the company was getting ready to ramp up production. When the IoT failed, the internal power supply would die. Troubleshooting the power supply found a shorted FET. Decapsulating the FVT found it was electrically overstressed. In order to fix the problem, we had to find the root cause of the overstress. The FET wasn't the only damage site on the board. Another damage site was found that was in the PCB under the FET. The picture on the right is a cross-section showing electrical breakdown between two layers in the PCB. A thermal analysis of the printed circuit board was performed. Differential scanning calorimetry was used to evaluate the PCB. The temperature was ramped up while measuring the heat flow in and out of the sample from the printed circuit board. Discontinuities in the curve identified an anomalous glass transition temperature. The anomaly indicated an improperly cured PCB resin. In a properly cured resin, there is only one glass transition temperature. The undercured board had a weak dielectric breakdown and eventually failed. The root cause was identified after analysis of all the failure sites on the board and working through which of the sites had to occur first. The origin of the failure was in the printed circuit board itself. The failure was isolated to one batch of boards and the IoT qualification was back on track. This last case study is on a smart meter that utilities use to report electricity usage. Meters were failing in the field after several months. Troubleshooting the failures found the problem was in the voltage regulator. The output was shorted to ground. 
Opening up the regulator found electrical overstress, which had fused bond wires and melted sights on the die. Although the failure mechanism is electrical overstress, we need to find the root cause to solve the problem. We first investigated what it would take to blow up the regulator. We tried loading the output and inducing transients on the input. The failure could not be reproduced. The design itself was good and could withstand adverse environmental conditions. When we looked at the product history, we found that all of the failures were occurring within a few manufacturing date codes. We then looked more closely at good meters built with regulators from the bad date code range. These were potentially bad units that had not yet failed. We found defects in the wire bonds. There were cracks in the die under the bond wires. The wire bond setup was incorrect and allowed the wires to lay against the silicon die. During bonding, the wire was impacting the die and causing cracks. Out in the field, the cracks would propagate into the die and short out the output transistor. When the output transistor shorted, it would explode and fuse the bond wire and destroy evidence of the defective ball bond. Field failures were causing expensive service calls to replace meters. Failure analysis not only identified the cause of the failures, but also quantified the scope of the problem and identified the specific meters to be recalled. Okay, Aram, back to you. So to summarize, we know that the complexity of the systems in our world are increasing. A lot of that is due to the microelectronic content that we are embedding into so many of the systems, tools, and products that we use in everyday life. Uh, as we do that, the cost of failure becomes high as we're more dependent on those products. Um, we don't want failures, but they do occur, and when they do occur, we want to be sure that we've got the right plan in place to deal with them. And that plan often includes a comprehensive approach and a multidisciplinary approach to deal with those failures. So uh, keep those things in mind as you <laughs> journey through the world of failure analysis. And of course, if you need help, uh, you can certainly call on us at EAG. We know how. <laughs>